if we have a hundred thousand yen a month for uh, the room, um, let's say that we've got three hundred thousand yen a month for the teacher and an admin person, it's probably not enough. But that is, you know, the teacher is going to be a minimum two hundred fifty thousand. If you're going to employ an admin person, that's going to be two hundred thousand. So there's another five hundred thousand a month. So we've got six hundred thousand yen in expenses before we've done anything. Really, you know, and then you add, let's just add another fifty thousand for utilities, etc. Let's just say your average student fees are ten thousand yen a month, which isn't particularly high, and obviously you should be aiming to get this as high as possible. It's a nice round number. We can see that we need sixty-five students to break even. Hi everyone, you're listening to Inside Japan. I'm back with Simon Moron to talk about why starting an English school is a big mistake for most foreigners living in Japan. People start a school thinking that this is a better way to make a long-term living as an English teacher in Japan, but this is a completely different job than teaching. Even worse, many start their schools with their Japanese spouse dealing with the parents of their prospective students, and this can have a really negative effect on their relationship as well. Here's Simon to tell us more. Simon, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Pleasure. Nice to be back. This time we're going to be talking about starting a school, and I want you to tell me about your story of starting your first school, and whether this is sort of like a typical story of a foreigner starting a school in Japan.、Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's typical,、um, but yeah, certainly. You know, I came to Japan in '95 and had a job、um, in a, quite a small school. <clears throat> Took me a while to get sort of settled down. And I worked there for a couple of years, and after a while, I just、uh, basically wasn't happy.、Mm. wasn't happy with the、um, I wasn't happy with the terms of my employment, I guess, and、uh, wasn't. I've never been particularly good employee. There's nothing wrong with being an employee. It's just not. It's not for everybody. It wasn't for me, and I wasn't happy with my employer either. An English guy and his Japanese wife. They were okay, you know, but.、Um, They kind of took everything for granted a bit,、mm. including I felt me. You know, they certainly took the students for granted.、Uh, there were two small classrooms next to each other, and we'd often have to go into each other's classroom to get materials out of the cupboard. And I remember going in one day when he was teaching in his classroom, and the kids are kind of doing some workbook or playing on top of the table, and he's got a book on his lap underneath the table. And he's reading up on his new Macintosh computer that he just bought, whilst while supposedly teaching these kids. You know, I'm just like, this is this is ridiculous. You know, and so I kind of felt, you know, a combination of things. Kind of, I kind of want to do my own thing. I had some private lessons as well that I was doing at the time.、Mm-hmm. So I,、um, when we when we started,、um, I agreed to give two months' notice to quit. So I I gave them two months' notice to quit by letter. And then I turned up at the school, and I'd basically been summarily, summarily sacked. Summarily sacked, difficult to say. And so that that became <clears throat> that that became a bit of a、um, a bit of a to and fro, and and all of that. But so I started on my own. And at, at this point, I really had no intention of starting a school, of starting a business. Didn't know what I wanted to do. I just started on my own. So I had a spare room in my apartment. And I started. I kept teaching my private students from there, and I advertised、um, through a local、uh, magazine called Pado, which still exists, but in kind of a very much、uh, different form. And you know, my Japanese、uh, was good enough at the time. <laughs> it seemed that I could answer the phone and arrange to meet people、uh, in a cafe to do like a level check and a, a free、yeah. trial lesson. And I was focused mainly on teaching adults at the time. And so I did that, and you know, thinking about it now, I don't know how I had the nerve to answer the phone in Japanese.、Uh, I would never do that now. My Japanese is significantly better now than it was then, and I would never answer the phone in Japanese to a potential customer now. But I did it then. You know, I was, I was young and had nothing to lose, and、uh, you know, probably a bit naive. And so I just、uh, I started、uh, building up. My school from that, and it was incredible how quickly it grew. Really, this is 1998 to put it into some perspective, and it was a pretty vibrant market. The market actually grew after 1998. It was a pretty vibrant market. I wasn't particularly confident with、uh, young, very young learners, so I was just doing adults at the time. But I started getting loads of students, and it was really successful. And so that that's how I started. So it was just me. I did everything. I was single. I did absolutely everything、uh, on my own. 
and um after a while i thought you know i could possibly turn this into something so um one of my students uh was bilingual so i took her on as a teacher uh, admin person continued to grow uh moved out of the premises that i was in uh sorry no moved out of the flat that i was living in and converted the flat into a three classroom school in a residential area and then a year later than that moved it down uh, to the station with three classrooms i'd taken on teachers at this point to teach the kids which i wasn't um i wasn't particularly keen on doing i didn't really feel i had the skills to do and um wanted to, <laughs> wanted people who were good at it and loved it uh, to to do so that's how i got my start so i'm not sure if that's typical but i went from employed teacher to self-employed teacher of privates to somebody who actually opened a school meaning that i rented premises refitted them did them out took on teachers you know had a curriculum and all of that which is very very different to me in my apartment just teaching to the individual or the group students yeah. so i'm not sure i'm not sure that's a typical story but looking back i would do lots of things differently including wondering whether i would actually have done it is yeah. the, the biggest one well it's funny because that kind of story i've heard a few times from a lot of different people is that they would start something in their apartment and eventually they would grow big enough for them to sort of start renting a place and i think a lot of people nowadays um the sort of people in in um the younger generation who have come to japan recently in the last sort of five years or so what they tend to want to do is go big they have a sort of maybe more like a tech startup kind of you know look at it where they're looking for an investor and someone who can uh help them go go big early and often they're doing it with their wife as well or their husband who's right. japanese and they they're sort of like well i'll do the english teaching part and you do the the admin part and um every time i hear that story i think this is really worrying this is not something that i would be uh, com as confident as some of these people are because um if you're it's not just that you need to speak japanese to to deal with customers you need to do everything you need to do marketing and right. writing and copy and um relationship building with all of these parents as well and the teacher isn't just you know and then then it also causes friction in the relationship as well and right. i've heard these kind of stories uh, many many times and my boss peter who uh, who runs um, jobs in japan he's told me he said that there are more uh there are more failed schools in japan than there are failed restaurants and in you know in the west right. you know, we think of a restaurant as maybe like the the fastest way to turn a small uh, a big fortune into a small fortune um yeah. And uh, yeah, so what's your thought about that for people who are thinking of starting a school? If they're yeah. thinking of that within their relationship, you know, yeah. what would be your advice? Uh, avoid it at all costs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this is, part of this, this is actually part of my sales pitch for Modern English Franchises and Affiliates, which I'm not going to pitch every single time I open my mouth on this podcast, but it's relevant, you know, and yeah. part of what I say is that Modern English becomes the spouse in that you've just identified exactly all of the the the, the, the division of labor in the mom and pop school you know sort of you know the foreign person does the teaching and the japanese spouse does everything else including you know crm marketing you know answering the phone doing the banking everything you know and there is a hell of a lot to do and it's a it's a it's the customer service industry and the customer services can uh, service can be really really tough so you know there are enough pressures on any relationship and any marriage there are more pressures on a, a bicultural marriage than there are on a normal marriage and then if you throw in running a business together to that unless your relationship is very very strong it could be uh really it could have a really really bad effect on on the relationship you're never going to be able to switch off you're always going to be taking work home and that, that inevitably there will be pressures i know of so many uh international marriages that have ended in divorce where the husband and wife have worked together that i would recommend against it very very highly you know and i think you've really got to think about you know do you actually want to start a school or are you just thinking you, you you'll do that because it's something that you can do and you, you're not happy working for your employer anymore um uh, noting what you say about you know younger people wanting to go with a, a bigger startup i think you know the industry has gone in that direction as well anyway in the the, the adult market has virtually disappeared it hasn't completely disappeared but compared to when i started there are very very few adults who will pay the high rates that we used to charge um 
to study English and, and you need those higher paying students to make a, a, a livable wage and there's only a certain yeah. number of hours you can teach in a week and there's a big big focus on on the kids market and there are so many great well-equipped schools around that if you don't have premises that have that wow factor the first time that parents walk in and they go to one that does have a wow factor they're, they're not going to join your school you know so I think the set of costs are much much certain the set of costs are certainly higher than when I started in my spare room. And I think the setup costs are really, really quite high. Rent a premises, do it out, get your, you know, your short throw interactive projectors, all your IT stuff, you know, um, big areas that kids can play. You, you're competing essentially with Gakado run by huge companies for mm-hmm. essentially you're competing for children's time after school is what you're competing for. So you're competing against swimming schools, you're competing against climbing walls, um, you're competing against Gakado singing hip hop all of these uh, uh after school activities is what you're competing against and uh, I, I think a higher level of investment is required than certainly yeah. was when, when i started absolutely and i think maybe a, a part of the reason why people think of starting an english school is because they lock themselves into this being a teacher thing when they maybe they didn't even start thinking that they wanted to be a teacher and maybe they're not that passionate about teaching anyway. They're just trying to get a bigger piece of the pie for themselves yeah. because they think, well, as an employee, I can't really make that much more money as an English teacher. And the only way if I'm going to stay, you know, like they're getting married or something, they have a Japanese uh, spouse and they have maybe um, kids on the way or they already have kids and they're thinking, how can I make more money? Yeah. And that's why they're starting a school, not because they're like, I'm so right. passionate about education. And I think all these schools are doing it wrong. And this is the way I think it should be done. And yeah. even if they do have that kind of vision, it's still, I think Japan is a kind of unique place when it comes to English language education, where other countries, other developed economies, they will look at English language education as a pathway to the future, a pathway to right. something that they can do that, um, you know, if you're brought up in, let's say, for example, Bulgaria or something, then they're thinking, if I speak English, then I get all of these opportunities in the world. Right. And in Japan, I think it's one of the few countries, and this has like been this has been researched, it's one of the few countries in the world where English language ability does not correlate in almost any way to income potential. Mm. Um, and that's yep. yeah, a big part of the reason why English language education in Japan is a, is a different beast. A big uh, part of my work, pre-COVID, uh, part of my work involved traveling to book fairs two or three times a year. And this is what I always used to say to international publishers who are very, very keen to get into the Japanese market because it is very big. It's largely sewn up by local publishers. But exactly what I used to say to them was that in Asia, Japan is the only country where there is no correlation at all between English ability and earning ability. And there isn't, there just isn't. You do not need English to succeed in Japan. Japan became the second biggest economy in the world without being able to speak English. Toyota is by volume, the biggest car manufacturer in the world. Of course they have English speaking people at Toyota, but the workforce doesn't need to speak English to succeed right. and to work in Toyota, you know? So those, uh, this is not true in Vietnam or Cambodia or China even. Um, so English for parents is kind of vocational in the same way that piano or singing lessons are or hip hop, or it is juku taught and it's for grammar and for tests for Aiken and for entrance tests to school. So you can certainly benefit um, from studying English if you study for Aiken or you study for entrance tests. So entrance into junior high school, high school, university is important to parents and English is a part of that. Um, but most foreigners who are starting schools will eschew teaching grammar and possibly not teach Aiken um, because they're working on fluency. And we're talking here about Aikaiwa, a term that I, I don't particularly like. You know, we think of ourselves as uh, PLS, private language schools. Uh, we and fluency we we teach four skills five if you if you look at um output as um interaction and presentation but essentially we're working on four skills and fluency is a big part of it you know being able to speak um but there is uh that's not useful for uh tests and for grammar so uh lots of parents don't see it as being educationally important. They might see it as being vocationally important and since in terms of, you know, raising a well-rounded, culturally uh, adept um, young human being who can, you know, play the piano and um, recite a few 
um, poems, I don't know, and, um, and speak English, you know, who, who wouldn't want their kids to be able to do all of that. But when crunch time comes around about grade four, um, grade five in elementary school, Juku is probably going to become more important. Yeah, and I think that's when a lot of people realize that there's a big drop off. And I, I noticed this when I was teaching uh, at a, uh, I, I had a job that is a kindergarten in the morning, and then you have a, a sort of long break for lunch, and then you start teaching the Aikaiwa kids in the afternoon, who were usually graduates from the school who had uh, continued with it to sort of maintain their English level. And what I noticed was that around grade three, four, like, you know, that's around nine years old or so, um, nine or 10, that's when you get this massive drop off. And I end up in my uh, oldest level class, I had three students and one of them mm. hardly ever showed up. So it was most of the time, just me and these two kids speaking in yeah. English. And it was really hard work <clears throat> because, you know, when you've got a class, there's a lot more you can do, but with one or two students with uh, sort of elementary age kids, it's a little bit uh, different. Yeah. So, you know, you have to, you have to focus. Uh, I mean, I, I gather you've got uh, quite an international audience for this podcast. So we've been talking about Juku, which are cram schools, uh, after school study schools for, for people abroad who don't know what they are. But so that means that the teacher of English, the foreign teacher of English, possibly native teacher of English, and that's another can of worms between native teachers of English and non-native teachers of English. But um, those foreign teachers of English are then going to ha probably have to focus on preschool and up to grade four or five it's not, i mean i do know people who have uh, very successful schools with a high number of junior high and high school students but they specialize and so you have to specialize in some way you know you've got to differentiate there are so many english schools around you know right. uh, and, and it, we're in a declining population uh, with an increased teaching of english in all state-run schools and that's only going to increase, you know, uh, there are lots of services online that people can use. We've just been through uh, soft lockdowns here in Japan, but that's certainly brought online more to the fore in, in learning and education. And that is often a race to the bottom in terms of contact payment for contact time. Right. Uh, people will expect online to be cheaper unless they can see some value in it. Uh, but there are lots of games and apps that, pe that people can use to, to learn English. So... Anybody starting a school has to specialize and they have to differentiate. And what are you going to do? And, you know, so that we're now we've been talking about running a business and being a teacher, being different skills. But within the field of, <clears throat> excuse me, within the field of English learning, what are you going to teach and who are you going to teach it to? You know, are you going to specialize on ages three to 10, say? And um, are you, are you going to do that? is your contact time going to be once a week and you're going right. to do it uh, after after school three or four times a week you know and remembering that you're um you're competing with chain schools and all of the other after school programs yeah that's the thing that's said. really difficult because that it becomes very quickly a race to the bottom that um especially with chain schools like they can they can hire people for a lower rate because they're usually hiring people their first year in japan and you don't want to be competing with people for the lowest amount of money you've right. ever earned in your life you know plus all of the risk that comes with starting a school you don't want to be um there, there are some places i've seen that they um they have all of these really hard sell tactics where they'll get someone in to their classroom for you know a few thousand yen for the first few months or something and uh and try and lock them into a, a contract in this way and a lot of those things like do you really want to be doing that with your time like trying to fight with chain schools that have really deep pockets and that can afford to yeah. like loss leader their business for a really long right. time when right. you're just trying to make enough money to get by um yeah. yeah you do really need to have something special that you're offering so like what are some of the yeah. things that you've seen that maybe newer schools or people who are actually really interested in education and want to be teachers and want to run a teaching business what are some mm. things that they can do to kind of differentiate themselves from those big chain schools that can get students for nothing and pay their teachers yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there's nothing new under the sun really. Is there, <laughs> you know? um, I think that, you know, obviously special specializing on, you know, making it obvious to people uh, how you're different, you know, mm. um, I think, you know, the, the bog standard, uh, ACI, a private language school that has, um, classes once a week, um, that are, are probably going to find things difficult mm. um uh, our schools that's pretty much what we do we have a few different e extra courses we also employ japanese teachers uh who who do the grammar and, and the aiken study and uh we try and encourage our kids to take uh, two lessons a week we haven't gone into um international kindergarten preschool 
market that's very that's a very very good market uh but to set up and set up well to do well it's a massive expense to uh to rent and refit premises so that you can run multiple classes of 20 to 30 three to six year olds a day you know yeah. and, then, and then the staffing for that is unbelievable you know you need uh, teaching assistants and teachers for each class uh health and safety are an issue if you're going to apply for this ninka and ninka guy you know the the, um, the local uh, you can get um um you can uh get um, ratified i'm struggling for a word here by the uh local government to um have Ninka or Ninka guy status, which will allow your parents to have subsidies of up to, I think it's 40 to 60,000 a month. I can't remember the numbers, don't quote, quote me on that, but that can be a great income incentive uh, uh, for, for the parents. But, um, you know, your setup costs on that are very, very large. I, I've been involved with one school recently that is a uh, Montessori International Preschool. And this is something that I'm going to help them grow. And it, it's a brilliant model. You know, Montessori yeah. is obviously very, very well known. And so uh, with Montessori, you essentially have families who know what Montessori is and want to go to a Montessori school. You have a teacher who's probably been a teacher of some other sort before coming, becoming a Montessori teacher who's already invested in themselves and um, invested in the Montessori training. And just the way that the Montessori schools are organized means that you have grades one, two, and three of kindergarten all in one class. And they can have up to 24 kids in one class with one teacher and one teaching assistant, like from 10 o'clock until two o'clock. And that is a fantastic business. It should make you a profit of about 8 million yen a year after paying mm -hmm. all the expenses, you know, and the set wow. of costs. Are, yeah, it's a fantastic business. And the set of costs on that are not that high because you're only you're only looking for one room uh, for one teacher and one teaching assistant. So that's definitely so that's a specialization. That's an example of a specialization, you know. It's I know interesting another guy, mm, because um, I've I've worked in Montessori schools before. So I worked right. at, um, at Fuji Kindergarten in Tokyo, which is a um, um, uh, I, I would call it a Montessori fu, like Japanese right. uh, Japanese style Montessori schools. It's not right. quite Montessori, but it's uh, <clears throat> it uses some of the principles and. Um, it, you're you're absolutely right that Mont like the people who are interested in Montessori, the parents who know what Montessori is, um, they're much more invested in getting their kids into one of those schools because they have much better outcomes. And uh, yeah. it's surprising to me that in Japan there aren't all that many Montessori schools. I think right. I um uh, when I was teaching back then it would have been 2016 or so um, when I started that was 2017 that um there were only something like. 300 Montessori schools in the entire country right. um, and that was including like Montessori uh, preschools and stuff so it is a very specialized thing and so if you can get people who are interested in that you'll be able to charge them a lot more because they want that specific kind of education not just yeah. at least to put their kid for a couple hours right and and yeah and you know I mean these and, you know we do hope to expand this so if you are interested please do get in touch but yeah. um that, you know, I, I can't imagine that we'll have a chain of 1,000 of them. You know, there would be one in each major, uh, several, you could, in, in large cities, obviously, you could have several of these schools. But, you know, for example, if we looked at the uh, the uh, Shinkansen line from Sendai down to Fukuoka, you know, we have one in Sendai, you know, yeah. one, in, uh, one in Shizuoka, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, it's specialization, high, high paying educated uh, parents who know what they're doing uh, the teachers are pre-qualified uh, this is not to say there won't be stresses in running at that school because there will be uh, but compared for example to your standard uh, Akira model it's a it's a very very attractive model i also know a guy who runs a school with seven or eight hundred students and he runs um morning classes for pre-k general english classes but he does a lot of after school uh, classes and kids can come you know one to five times a week and he's got seven to eight hundred students he runs about 24 teachers so it's a massive management job it's a massive hr job hi everyone i hope you're enjoying the conversation and i just want to take a quick moment to mention that this podcast is only possible because of the support of jobsinjapan.com so next time you're looking for a job check out jobsinjapan.com there are tons of jobs on there not only in english teaching but also software engineering hospitality marketing and consulting among many others most of the jobs on the board do not require any specific level of japanese and you can get started in minutes so so next time you're looking for a job, check out jobsinjapan.com and let's get back to the conversation.
that's a part that I wanted to ask you about as well, because running teachers, that's a completely different job. You know, that you can yeah. you can have the sort of like husband and wife team where they, you know, it's the, right. the one of them teaches the English and the other one does the parent management. But then once you start hiring teachers, it's a completely different game because yeah. trying to get people on board who um, who believe in what your school believes in and actually want to, you know, help your school to succeed um but that you also have good working relationships with like yeah. that whole hr thing is incredibly complicated so what do you do when because you've got a lot of franchisees a lot of people who um run yeah. your schools how do you end up actually managing the people so that they actually want to do a good job or that they do a good job without you know having this sort of revolving door of, of yeah. foreigners who come in for a year and leave well it's it's very very difficult and in fact the reason that i did franchising uh, was to to avoid HR. Really. Um, <laughs> well, no, it's that sounds a bit cynical. It's not, you know. I I I own one school, and that that head school that I own, I employ two teachers, and then the office staff all work there as well. So I employ four office staff at that school, and they're great. We've got a great team. It's brilliant, mm. you know. Uh, one teacher's been with us for ten years. One's a relatively new hire. Uh, but before that, you know, so our longest serving teacher, I think, was with us for 10 or 11 years. Uh, one of our teachers has currently been with us for 10 years. We like people to stay a long time, but it is very difficult to find people and to keep them. And, you know, we've already hinted at salaries. You know, this industry is not a particularly well paying industry and you get to the glass ceiling pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but for me, um, I had an early experience with a branch, uh, probably, I don't know, a year or two after I started on my own um uh with a partner oddly enough did a branch so this basically showed me that i didn't want a partner and i didn't really enjoy having a branch the location wasn't great i had to travel to get to it it wasn't easy to travel to it was uh two train lines and when it would have been uh it would have been quicker probably cycling there um and it was difficult to manage because of the distance but it was also difficult to manage employees remotely and what i wanted to do really was to put people find people in the situation that I was in and help them uh, do what I did when I first went independent. Because when I went independent, overnight, everything just meant so much more to me. You know, I started working harder. Um, I started working better. I just put in more effort naturally because it was my own gig. Everything mm -hmm. meant, meant so much more to me. So the idea of franchising was to help people in that situation. I think I said earlier on that I, um, you know, I used to answer the phone in Japanese and I can't believe that I did that. So we provide all of those back office services uh, for our franchisees. We answer the phone, we do all the admin, we speak to the students, we do the scheduling, collect the money and all of that, which allows the, the teacher to get on and, and, and do the teaching. And I think that's a great model because you don't have to worry about the management or the admin and you can, you can focus. So for example, one of our franchisees is in a good location in a, in a city center location and he only wants to teach adults and he's in a location where he can get the adults is is the thing it's not possible everywhere but that allows him and what he said was like i want to do my own thing but i didn't want to have a boss and i don't want to do those services and so he uses ours and that's why i did franchising as opposed to opening up branches you need a very very uh, particular skill set to do hr well and um, most people haven't got a background in hr and yeah you know of course most people can get on with people pretty well but you've then got to start to deal with employment contracts labor standards law uh on ongoing professional development hiring training firing uh holiday pay um social insurance all of those things that you then have to deal with as a, an employer and there's a hell of a lot to deal with and i'm sure right. this is true of all small and medium-sized businesses all over the world the bureaucratic um and legal obligations on small businesses does not differ uh to those to large businesses and that's one reason why you know those large businesses have an advantage because they have an hr department they have a legal department they could do and that's with. not usually a skill set that is common within the same person like being able to right teach requires you know empathy and uh creativity and planning but then being able to do hr requires uh like different kinds of people skills but it also requires you also need to have a good uh understanding of numbers and you need to be very organized in terms of planning um right. and uh, and discussions and stuff and making sure that you know you've done all of your obligations legally and and i think that's not necessarily going to be a skill set that everybody who likes to teach is going to have yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so there are, we're talking about all the negatives here, you know, or not necessarily the negatives, but the, the difficulties, you know, there are sort of good, there, there are wonderful things about running your own show as well, you know, but I, I think if you can keep it small and keep it lean, it's just you and you're teaching and just say, for example, you're using some services or you've got one person who does all of your admin and, and um, uh, you know, a, a, a CRM and all of that, and you're not married to them and it's not going to affect your personal <laughs> life, you know. You can get to choose your own hours and you can, and if you specialize and, and call people into that and you stick to your guns, it, it can be great. I think one thing that people should be aware of is that if, particularly if you're teaching young learners, you're probably going to have a limited appeal as you age, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 54. I'm quite happy to say that I'm getting on a bit, you know, I would not be, I'm still got all my hair, but uh, you know, I'm not sure how attractive I would be to parents of, uh, of young children as a teacher of young right. children and is that would that continue up until i'm 65 you know so i think you've got to bear all that in mind as well yeah absolutely um so there's one more thing i want to ask about when it comes to starting a school is um the numbers so we've uh, i think you wrote a blog post about this that i looked at and i thought wow this makes so much more sense now is that i think most <laughs> people are not really aware of the numbers um not only when they're starting a school but if they're mm. for example buying a school from like a um an already set up organization so that they can have right. a sort of starting amount of students that yeah running the numbers on those kinds of things um is is really you need to think you need to understand what yeah. those numbers mean so how can you explain a little bit about um running numbers on a startup school on a startup yeah running the numbers yeah doing the numbers is really important i'm <clears throat> i'm lucky i guess i've always kind of enjoyed uh, uh playing the numbers and i'm reasonable at it i'm not great at it i'm reasonable at it um on a startup school so obviously so people, people do come to me and say, how much do I need to start a school? And I'm like, what kind of school do you want to start? And where do you want to start? You know, so if you're going to be on the first floor in Shinjuku on a main road uh, with four classrooms, your startup costs are going to be very, very different than if you're going to be in, you know, a residential area in, I don't know, Fukui, say, you know. So that's the first thing is that location is going to dictate your startup costs uh, so much. Um, if you're, let's just say that, let's just look at the economics of a one person classroom. You know, this, this could be a, a subset of a larger school, but if you've got one classroom and that's costing you, you just make the numbers easy, right? So we'll just say that's a hundred thousand yen a month to rent that space. And it, let's just say that you are, um, oh, is this self-employed or are we employing somebody? Um, let's say for, to start off with, if you're starting your own school, um, or if you're buying a school from somebody who has already, you know, maybe okay. already started and has like, uh, you know, two dozen students or something. Okay. If you, well, if you're buying, if you're buying a school from somebody, I think the thing to be aware of is that if they've been the only teacher of those students at that school for a long time, you have to be prepared that a lot of the students will, may well leave when, when the teacher does, because they've got a, an important personal relationship. Right. with that owner but essentially you know you need to look at your gross income minus your costs to see what your earnings are and if and do those earnings include a salary for that teacher or not and um, a lot of people look at it in that what's left over at the end is the profit it doesn't really work like that you've got to account for all of your your, your uh, hr expenses as well so from that uh, from that one person room if we if we have a hundred thousand yen a month for uh the room um let's say that we've got three hundred thousand yen a month for the teacher and an admin person it's probably not enough for that it's you know the teacher is going to be a minimum two hundred and fifty thousand. if you're going to employ an admin person that's going to be two hundred thousand. so there's another five hundred thousand a month so we've got six hundred thousand yen in expenses before we've done anything really you know and then you add, let's just add another 50,000 for utilities etc let's just say your average student fees are 10,000 yen a month which isn't particularly high yeah. and obviously you should be aiming to get this as high as possible it's a nice round number we can see that we need 65 students to break even yeah and that's if you're you know? not claiming any money like you're if, if you're the teacher maybe you're getting the 250,000 if you're not the teacher then you yeah. have no profit to show from right from 65 students and a whole organization and tons of work that you're doing every month for, for no yeah. profit and i would say that the 250 is probably low 
uh, the, you know, this, this 100,000 rent figure, whether that's uh, reasonable or not, I don't know. Can you put those 65 students into a reasonable schedule? Yeah, you probably can. Um, so, but, you know, if you then take that to 100 students, and you'd be you'd have a net of three hundred and fifty thousand a year in a month, which is thirty five percent, which is actually very very good. But mm -hmm. can you put those hundred students into a compact timetable for that one teacher to teach or not? And if you've got a hundred students, it's unlikely that you will ever be at one hundred percent capacity of your available slots, right? So you're probably max going to max out about seventy eighty percent. Um, of all of your slots being filled so let's just say 80 percent. so so that means what, sorry, just to, to make sure that i'm clear on this that means having classes where you know you can have a maximum of 12 students or something in a class but mm -hmm. uh you only have eight students or nine students yeah, because right a time slot that none of the kids who want to go to the class can fit yeah i mean it's very unusual for anything to ever be at full capacity some will be at some point you know but like hotels are never at full capacity you know right. um so you look at your your uh yeah your uh your, your, your fullness rate your capacity rate you know so say you're running at 80 percent capacity um that means that 100 percent capacity if we're looking at those uh, 100 students will be 125 students right so how many students have you got in a class um, I don't know because I think I think the um, there are some laws on this in terms of what you can have for an Ikaiwa versus for a kindergarten at certain ages. So I remember at the kindergarten we had to have one teacher per eight students. Um, so I think that was that was the maximum you could have without two teachers in the classroom was eight. And That's so if you're regulated, right? Uh, so one thing to bear in mind is that private language schools are unregulated, the vast majority of them. So that wouldn't apply. Now, that would explain be... why I had uh, a <laughs> class when I was uh, in my first school in Fukuoka. I would explain why I had a class of 16, four to five year olds and no co-teacher. And I was yeah. by myself and couldn't speak Japanese. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, so there's 125 uh, students. How many in a class? Six, eight? 10 yeah probably probably eight on average eight to ten. Eight, right what's uh 125 divided by eight who can do this quicker um 15 15, 15. yeah 15 15.67 <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. um so so if that's 15 classes a week that's yeah. manageable that's manageable you know okay you, that, that, that sounds like something you could do so you're going to be closed two days a week presumably to give this employed teacher two days off so you're probably going to be closed sunday and monday um, and this one teacher is going to teach 15 classes. So 15 classes is reasonable, but if these are all children who go to school, you've got to do all of those classes from 3.30 or 4 o'clock in yeah. the afternoon. So, and preferably before sort of 8 o'clock so that they're right. not going home after dinner or whatever. Right. So I reckon you would struggle to get 15 of those classes into a reasonable timetable over yeah. uh, That's at least three week. classes every day back to back right. uh from right. three o'clock till six o'clock right at which, the minimum yeah which three o'clock that's an early start you yeah know, right kindergartners there you four, know let's say four to seven so yeah so it becomes yeah. very complicated to actually schedule that yeah. and, and being the owner of that school like that would uh you know that if that teacher gets sick which you know if you're hand, if you're mm. dealing with kids you know uh hundreds of them in a one week period um yeah. the chance of you getting sick is really high because kids as you well know are incubators of the viral plague <laughs> and um yeah so i've i've gotten sick a lot um from from being around kids and i have a pretty good constitution so then having mm. that means you need to have either a, another teacher to come and help support or yeah. you need to be ready at any time to get a right. call from the teacher saying i'm sick and then you have to cancel all your plans and go in and teach yeah class. yeah so you know I mean, that's uh yeah that's all off, off the top of our heads and that's probably you know you could pick holes in, in into all of right. that but yeah i think you would struggle to have three class three afternoon classes that are full enough of kids um and then the saturday <clears throat> to to get those earnings and to make that um to make that profit i'm not right. i'm not sure how easy that would be if you're if you're doing this on your own you know and you set out those um you set out your times i would say specialize there's a guy i know in tokyo who runs a school and he has 10 in a class or 12 sorry, no sorry 12 in a class and he teaches by himself uh, he doesn't use textbooks and he charges 10,000 yen a month, you know, and those are great numbers, you know, and you have two of those classes a day. Now he's in, he's in a part of Tokyo, he's got like six or eight elementary schools around him, 
he's yeah. got a he's got a uh, he's got a good uh, population uh, of potential students around him. So you need to look at the demographics, you know. But I, I would say, you know, look for something that's a bit different. Uh, that's not the classic model. So that that school is a good is a good uh, is a good example. He does like a portfolio way of teaching, and the Montessori one is a, is a good example. You know, your bog standard A car is going to be difficult. I think preschool. Uh, international preschools are great, but they're a huge, huge set of costs and, and mm. difficulties managing uh, little human beings and teachers and assistants. You know, I don't want to put people off, and certainly if people want our help, get in touch. But it might not be as easy as you think. And right. I think this is the thing. Thinking back to when I started, I didn't really think very deeply about it. I just did it. Yeah. And uh, it was a the market was very, very different at the time. I think this is something else that we need to mention that I started in 1998, and the market grew. Um, and it grew a lot in the early 2000s. Then we got to 2007 and it fell off a cliff. Mm. There was basically, it was massive growth in the adult market. Nova used to advertise primetime TV every night. It was huge awareness. Uh, kids uh, English was, was also booming. But then there was the Nova shock in 2007. There was the layman shock the same year. And there was a, a drop in the market generally. And estimates range that between 40 and 60% of the total market was lost in 2000. Wow. 7 2008 there's a graph with this on my blog if people are going to have a look at it <clears throat> now year on year the market has grown every year since then but it's very very small growth that has got nowhere near approaching uh the the cliff face from which it fell so um get, have a look at the have a look at the graphic on my blog and for those of you watching this online it, it's gone like this <laughs> Sound effects. Sound effects, that sound effects is going to be great on the audio podcast. <laughs> sound effects and a finger map for people watching online. Um, so that's something that needs to be mentioned because when I was doing it, it was certainly easier than it was now. And I didn't yeah. think about it that much. Um, if I was, so how old was I then? I was probably 30. I don't know. Yeah, I was 30 just before I became 31. If I was 30, 31 now, looking at starting my own school, I think it would be a lot more difficult and the startup costs would be a lot higher. You'd have to be focusing on young learners. You'd have to specialize and you'd ha have to either specialize to be your class sizes and or your curriculum or something else. You know? Yeah, something, and I think specialization is a really important one and it needs to be a specialization that actually makes sense to um, the parents. Like you need to have yeah. a specific <clears throat> Uh, demographic in mind. So a couple of years ago, a friend and I wanted to start a school for critical thinking um, for as, a, <laughs> as an after school club for the high school kids that we we are both yeah. in high school. And we thought, you know, these kids are not very good at this. They haven't really been yeah. taught this. And mm. um, we tried to start the school and we we put money into advertising. We put um, we printed flyers and sent them to a lot of the sort of international schools in Tokyo, talked to the international schools about, um, you know, whether there were some <clears> students that we could help with that. And, um, and we end up closing the thing after maybe six months and putting in a lot of work and money yeah. just because we thought this, I, I don't think there's really an easy market for this without going a lot bigger because it's very difficult to, yeah. to teach um, that kind of thing. Because most parents in Japan don't really know what the benefit of critical thinking is. You know, they hardly... Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's on the syllabus now, you know, it, it's been pushed by Monbusho. So I think uh, people do now, uh, mm -hmm. particularly elementary school students and you know, you're hint, you're, you know, going bigger, you know, you're hinting at something here that we should mention as well. And that the, the after school provision of child care or child activities market has grown immeasurably because yes. of the number of double working families. And again, this is going to be location specific, you know, in some rural areas, for example, we still have three generational households. So there right. isn't a child care need in some places in urban centers there is obviously there's been a move out of um city centers a little bit because of covid you know so people are leaving to the center of tokyo and going to chiba and saitama uh, more than they ever have done of course there are still a, a hell of a lot of people in, in tokyo maybe that's a hope there, as well in a way that um because of the pandemic that people will be <clears throat> um less likely to be so concentrated in uh urban city centers and um, the, mm. there might be a little bit more provision out in the countryside and i've got a few friends who have moved out to the countryside with their family in the last mm. year or two and that that's been a really good thing for them because you know now, now their child isn't as sort of 
chaotically bounced around all of these after school things yeah that's another thing as a as a, a teacher as well that i always felt sorry for a lot of the students who were being you know pushed by their parents to go to you know they've got piano practice at this time they've got yeah. english class at this time then they've got juku where they need to practice their yeah. mind. they're getting home at you know eight or nine p.m exhausted from a mm. from more than 12 hours a day of just constant activities which hints at the the opportunity that i think exists but this is probably out of the reach of uh uh, well, me and, and most people uh, listening to this podcast, but the opportunity for an after-school destination is is big. I think you know, so you can do swimming and climbing and piano and critical thinking and programming and all of those other activities in one place, and then you'll get dropped off at home, or the parents will come and pick you up. And English would be a part of that, you know. So sounds like, uh, you... sounds like a great business idea, Simon. Let's uh, let's talk about that after the podcast and start working. <laughs> Well, well, yeah. somebody, can you introduce us <laughs> to somebody who finance it? This we'll is get a question. few billion yen together and, uh, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll start that thing. But yeah. um, okay, so let's, uh, I want to wrap up this one because um, it's sure. been a lot of information about starting a school. Um, for most people, I would say if you're a teacher, uh, starting a school is a, is a very challenging thing. If you're really passionate about education and you have a specific um uh, a speciality that you want to focus on like Montessori or you know something like that then I think there's a lot of opportunity still even though um, not as much as there was in the in the 90s and, and up to 2007 so yeah that would be um, a good thing to think about if you are thinking of planning a, uh, to start a school then um, consider your numbers think about what what job you'll actually be doing and uh, and I would say <laughs> the same as uh, as what Peter said and the same as what Simon has said on this podcast if you're starting this with your spouse that is a huge huge risk and i would be very careful of doing that kind of thing yeah modern english is the spouse always remember that. <laughs> <laughs> all right um thank you so much simon pleasure